Hello everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, May 14th. Today's topic is our featured teacher, Nate Balcom. He's our special guest. Your show hosts are Peggy George. I'm Lori Moffat. Tammy Moore. Thanks to Tammy for doing the closed captioning. And Paula Noggle. Paula will now introduce Nate and ask him the newbie question. Good morning, everyone. This is Paula Novel coming in from New Orleans, Louisiana. I hope everybody's hearing me okay. <clears throat> okay. It is my great pleasure to introduce our featured teacher for the month of May. May Balcom has taught for 12 years and is currently the integration specialist at Star Elementary in Nebraska. He was born and raised in Kearney, Nebraska, and graduated from the University of Nebraska for both his bachelor's and master's degrees. He is currently pursuing another de master's degree in technology leadership at UNK. He and his wife have two amazing boys, age 12 and 9, and two daughters, age 6 and 4. And he says they are the luckiest parents in the world. Nate is a Google certified teach, uh, educator level one. And he was a, nine, a 2014 BAMI Awards nominee for Teacher of the Year and was named one of the 140 Nebraska education leaders to follow. While I have yet to meet Nate in person, we interact most Monday evenings on Fourth Chat. And I have participated in his March Book Madness, a global project he hosts and will tell us more about today. It is my great pleasure to introduce our featured teacher for May, Mr. Nate Balcom. And Nate, I have a newbie question for you. What does Web 2.0 mean to you and why do you use Web 2.0 tools in your classroom? Oh, thanks, Bella. Great introduction. Uh, Web 2.0 for me means uh, the connectedness piece, the collaboration and the communication between uh, classrooms. It means knocking down the, the walls of our uh, rooms and really having a global classroom instead of um, an isolated silo that it used to be. Well, thank you for that. And now we are excited to hear all about what you have to present for, for us today. I'm so excited that you agreed to be with us. And I look forward to hearing all about all the great things you do with your students. All right. So let's see here. Do I have slide, slide control? I'm sorry, I didn't ask that. Yes, I do. OK, here we go. So we're going to talk about March Book Madness today. And um, March Book Madness is actually a project that I've been doing for several years in my classroom uh, when I was a teacher. Um, uh, I was a fourth grade teacher and a fifth grade teacher. And um, as you can see in this slide, um, some of my boys are actually filling out their brackets. Um, it's something we didn't get to this year, and I hope to resurrect for next year's March Book Madness. But um, filling in the brackets and trying to figure out um, who's going to win. Uh, the idea is that students nominate uh, books during January and February, and then the books compete against each other to uh, see who's going to win. Um, my first year was in 2014, and this was our bracket uh, during that time. And in the end, uh, Ellen Raskin's wonderful mystery novel, The Westing Game, um, won for our pick for best book of the year. This was in fifth grade only. And um, the kids uh, voted by hand this time, uh, uh, sticking ballots in a box, actually, to uh, do that. Um, if you're wondering about the awesome avatars that I'm using, uh, they are from Bitmoji. And I uh, use Apple's preview app to remove the background so I can drop them on top of my slides. Um, which is just a lot of fun. Makes everything happier. If you want to know how to do Bitmoji, there's a video on my website under the quick video tips links. 
2015, I changed job roles and became the integration specialist here at STAR. And uh, in doing that, I expanded the March Book Madness to include the second through fifth graders um, with a single chapter book bracket, just like I had done in the classroom. And uh, the Global Read Aloud book, uh, one for the Murphys, won that year as a school. And uh, we had Carly. Carly's the main character of the book. And we had a fifth grader, Carly, so she presented uh, the winning book to the Twitterverse uh, via this picture. And uh, because of connections we established with Linda Mullaly Hunt during the Global Read Aloud, um, she was actually able to make a connection with this student um, over um, the March Book Madness. And she was very excited um, that her book won our competition. Now, this last spring, um, I participate in a weekly chat on Tuesday, uh, every other Tuesday evening on uh, Midwest Librarian Chat, because I'm also the librarian at my school. And um, we were talking about March Book Madness, and the uh, other teachers in that chat uh, challenged me to think a little bit globally uh, with March Book Madness this year instead of um, just containing it to our school. And so um, out of Midwest Lib Chat, um, came our Global March Book Madness, which spread rather quickly. Now, I will be the first one to say that I'm not the only one doing March Book Madness globally. Um, there are a few other hashtags that you can follow. So if you don't want to start your own, there's definitely ones that you can jump in with. Um, in the pictures here, we've got um, students from different schools participating and voting online. Um, this case, the paper votes weren't going to work as well, so I created Google uh, Forms uh, for students to fill out and embedded those on our web page. And also, uh, because we went global, I also included the kindergartners and first graders, as well as the second, and all the way up to 12th grade actually voting. So we had two brackets, one bracket for the picture books and graphic novels, and one bracket for chapter books, graphic novels, and young adult books. And uh, just had a great success. In the end, um, the day the crayons quit and the Hunger Games uh, won the competition this year. Uh, classrooms all around the country uh, created brackets. Um, the bracket at the top uh, is the official bracket from uh, Star Elementary here in Grand Island. We housed the official bracket. Um, took a lot of work to hang out, but it turned out pretty awesome. Uh, down below in the other pictures, you can see uh, Brackets from Barbara Nebraska over here, Barb Gilman, as well as other brackets with the students doing some of the work hanging them up. Now, moving on, here's a, another look at the Google Forms. One of the great things about Google Forms is you can see that it works both on, on iPads and on computers, so it's platform agnostic. And uh, down below, uh, we can see how we voted in primary. Uh, primary didn't use the uh, Google form at my school. We did the classic um, move to the left side of the room, move to the right side of the room to vote, especially during the beginning rounds of the competition. Um, the first two rounds are the hardest to get through because getting through the 64 books um, just takes a while. Um, in January and February, we had over 402 book recommendations from students that got turned in and uh, submitted via Google Forms online and via emails from teachers um, for students that were not online. Um, we had, uh, I had teachers register uh, using another Google Form just to keep track of who was participating. And our max was at 2,328 students registered. And that just astonished me. I was completely blown away that 2,000 people were participating. And it increased and decreased as we were going. But it was an incredible first go. And we had participants from 13 states uh, across the United States. So that was amazing coast to coast and almost top to bottom, which was awesome. Um, here at my school, the, the teachers did a lot of discussing with the kids during the uh, month of March and uh, just exploring the brackets. They took a lot of pride in the fact that uh, we owned the program, kind of, um, and they had a really good time uh, doing that. 
one of the very cool things that happened was uh, because of the megaphone that Twitter becomes, uh, we actually connected with some authors uh, during the uh, March Book Madness. And um, Natalie Lloyd, which is somebody I had not connected with before, the author of Snicker of Magic and others, um, was very excited to see um, that she was uh, a contender in March Book Madness and has continued the connection afterwards uh, with our students. Um, unfortunately, her book lost shortly after uh, we posted this with her. And in a shameless plug, um, I was also featured on our local news uh, because our news Twitter folks follow me and they uh, saw what we were doing, thought it was pretty awesome, and decided to stop by one day and just did a quick article sort of mirroring the March Book Madness with the March Madness uh, sports stories that were going on uh, during the month. Um, our timeline of how this works, and we are planning to continue it again next year. Um, in January and February, we're going to start a little bit earlier with the book recommendations, um, but getting those uh, recommendations sent in and um, so we can compile. Uh, it actually, we had so many recommendations this year that we had to only choose books that had more than one recommendation, which really did uh, weed out some of the books and left a lot of good quality literature uh, behind. We do need to make a push for uh, more picture book nominations next year. Uh, we just, we didn't have as many as the chapter books. Uh, in February, I will get the brackets created, and we will again get those out a little bit earlier so that the kids can uh, begin filling them out. Um, I provide all the resources for teachers that sign up um, via Google Drive so that they have all the materials that they need. And then in March, we spend the four weeks of voting. Um, we send out a calendar of when the votes need to be in by, and every classroom has an opportunity to get it done. Uh, in my classroom, it usually took into April, and we might have to extend it this year because we really had to push hard to get them done uh, by March, and I think we lost a few participants because we were going too fast. And moving on from March Book Madness, which is awesome, I wanted to share a few other uh, very cool things that we have done uh, in our classroom and in my school. Um, I'm a very passionate um, games and learning uh, person, uh, both gamification and uh, game-based learning. And um, if you'd like to learn more about those things, there's some sections, especially in the NEDA 16 section of my website where I presented a couple of weeks ago at the Nebraska Education Technology Association Conference on uh, game-based learning. Um, but we do badges, we do um, quests and role-playing games. In my classroom, we had students hacking um, board games to make them educational. Um, for our ELL students that don't get social studies, they created board games that allowed them to teach the social studies to our ELL students um, on days when they uh, did not have class to catch them up on the work. Um, we had badges in our classroom, and I still do badges in my media center. Um, the, down here, the computer. Each computer in the computer lab has name tags that showcase the badges of the students and what they've earned. Um, in my classroom, uh, we showcased them on the wall, and I've also used Edmodo. Um, I mostly create my own badges using um, either Canva or Google uh, Drawing. Uh, and PictoChart has a lot of good uh, clip art. I also use uh, the Pixabay uh, to get a lot of my graphics to make um, our badges. Um, in the past, when I was in the classroom, I used a lot of discarded Foursquare badges that they used back when Foursquare did badging. Um, I've used badges, uh, both the, the students actually prefer the physical badges. I, I joke that uh, badges are a lot like the stickers of the 21st century generation. Um, they don't like stickers as much, but if you call it a badge, they go kind of crazy for it. Um, and they preferred the, the paper badges themselves. Um, we also did them on Edmodo, because Edmodo has embedded badging system in it. Uh, one of my most successful game-based initiatives was when I gamified homework. And um, in fifth grade, uh, my students were lacking the skills that they needed to complete Unit 7 and Division, um, because our spiraled curriculum wasn't spiraling quite as tightly as the students needed to. And um, with the, the homework 
uh, I listed out a list of skills and all of that information is on my website in a couple different places. But each student uh, literally got differentiated homework every single evening during the week. So at one time I might have 20 students doing 15 different homework assignments. They would take their homework home, individualized for them, um, using superteacherworksheets.com. It was basic math computation. And um, each week they'd practice, each night they'd practice it Monday through Thursday. Um, they would come in in the morning and check their own work. I didn't worry about checking it because they were only cheating themselves. And uh, on Fridays they would have our boss battles. We'd listen to Packing and Fever and some Mega Man music. And um, they would, instead of calling it a quiz, they would have a boss battle and try to beat that level of homework that they were working on during the week. And if they successfully leveled up, they would get more difficult homework the next week. And if they uh, did not, they'd have to repeat the level. And I had students repeat the level several weeks in a row. They just got better eventually. I'd work with them. I also had two students that made it through all 33 levels of my game-based homework. And um, it was getting to the point at the end of it where the math was so difficult, I had to have uh, my, my mother-in-law check the homework because and teach me the strategies because they were surpassing what I was able to teach them, which was really meeting their needs where they were at. They did not need the homework that everybody else needed. So my, I would very much advocate for the, the game-based uh, leveled homework. Um, you could do it with other skills. I've uh, presented several times and the teachers have done it with uh, basic grammar skills as well as vocabulary and that kind of thing. So anything where you can make a continuum of um, skills that you can stretch across levels that works pretty well. The um, last thing with gaming that I got into was actually creating uh, role playing. And the students did uh, created avatars and characters and um, actually leveled up their characters by learning different skills at school. And it's a pretty complicated system, and, but it, the students had a lot of fun. And if you have questions about that, I would be happy to answer them later. But it's pretty complicated. Um, one of my other passions is the Global Read Aloud. And um, I have to start off by saying I did not start the Global Read Aloud. Pernille Rip did. Um, she's at Pernille Rip on Twitter. Um, it is a fantastic, amazing program that's connected students across the world uh, through books. It's like a global book club that happens during the month of October and November every year. Um, planning is just getting finished up for that for next year. Uh, they chose the books a couple weeks ago. And you read the books a lot of your students and then connect with as many people online as you can during those six weeks. It's a great um, balance to March Book Madness in the spring and Global Read a lot in the fall. Um, for connecting around literature. Um, this year, the Global Read Aloud, uh, and there's more information about this on my website too, but the Global Read Aloud had a half a million students connecting globally this year, which was absolutely astounding. Um, and it's run completely uh, by Perniel. She's a seventh grade language arts teacher in Wisconsin. Um, she does it in her free time, as they call it. Um, and uh, it's really up to the teacher how they connect. So you can connect by pen pals and physical letters. You can connect on Twitter, Skype, Google Hangouts, uh, Padlet, just about any way you are comfortable with connecting. You can make a connection with the class during the Global Read Aloud. She is a fantastic lady and does a great job. It looks like she's also been on <laughs> uh, Classroom 2.0, which is fantastic. She's a great lady. Um, on this uh, slide, you can see the connections that we've made. And I have a, a good history of the Global Read Aloud in a presentation that I did in the NIDA section on my website. And I think that's good. We can move on to questions if we're ready to do that. Thanks, Nate. Yes, I did capture questions. This goes back to uh, the picture books that you had in your uh, March Book Madness. Are the picture books just for the younger kids? Um, that's a good question. Or, uh, this year, they. I, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry I, go. The chat moved as I was trying to answer or ask the question. <laughs> Are the picture books just for the younger kids, or can students choose books from any of them? Um, the 
when I first started the, the March book notice, the picture books were just for uh, were for everybody. Uh -huh. We just incorporated them in. And this last year, we just made it for the kindergarten through second graders. Okay. It's up for up for debate if somebody wants to <laughs> have good suggestions for next year. I'm all uh -huh. game. Okay. Do you expect the students to read or have read all the books they are voting for? And what criteria have you developed for your students to evaluate the books? Oh, great question. Um, that's probably the question I get asked the most from participants is the expectation for reading them. And uh, I don't expect the students to have read all of the books. I, I sort of expect they've read the ones they've nominated, but um, I'm a big mm -hmm. proponent of Stephen Lane's um, Passion for Reading book. And um, this is all about driving that passion and not necessarily uh, ensuring that the students have read it. The Hunger Games made it a long ways, I think, because of the movie, not necessarily because they've read the book. But um, I do, uh, there are schools that um, have the students write um, reports and do some research on each of the books, but that's kind of up to the teacher. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm getting other questions as I'm trying to ask these. Do you ever have authors or publishers lobbying you for specific books? Um, I have not yet. I'm <laughs> not that popular yet, but we'll find out. <laughs> okay. Okay. What's the best time for people here in, with Classroom 2.0 to tweet about your next year's competition? For the March Book Madness? Um, mm -hmm. Any time after Christmas would be good to get okay. excited. <laughs> We'll start okay. up right after Christmas break. Um, this goes back to the badges. What do your students do with their badges? Um, mostly displaying them. We haven't uh, gotten any kind of a token economy uh, established, but they, they are uh, very prideful. And uh, we do often allow them to level up to different levels of the badges. So even if they've made um, one level, for example, logging into the computer, um, mm -hmm. They can get to the second level by logging in without looking at their uh, login cards and that kind of thing. So okay. there's usually always another goal to get to. Uh, is it hard to do both your March Book Madness and a Global Read Aloud in the same year? I guess oh. was the question. No, they're spread out enough that it's pretty easy to participate. It mm -hmm. makes kind of a hectic six weeks okay. on both, both ends, but not too much. Right. Okay. Are you doing anything with HyperDocs? I have not heard of HyperDocs, but I'm interested. I'm writing it down. <laughs> okay. And I think it was Paula who asked about HyperDocs, I think. Awesome. Would you tell us about your iReading groups? Sure. Um, iReading group was a long time ago for me. Uh, seems like a long time ago. The group, the, the first group that did iReading group is actually graduating this weekend. Um, the iReading group was uh, an idea that I had. Um, for uh, students that maybe are reading books, sort of like the Global Read Aloud, that don't, don't have anybody to discuss it with. Mm -hmm. So our guided reading groups would uh, create uh, chapter discussion videos at the end of their guided reading book and then post those online for uh, other students to participate in their uh, reading group. And for a few years, I bought the domain iReading group. I've, I've let it lapse, but we have the archive.org copy up on my website. Um, mm -hmm. The playlists are available. Thanks for putting the links in there, Peggy. And um, they're still valid today. The, the Surviving the Apple Whites videos were my first book that we did. And then the, second, the next year we did um, the first Harry Potter book, which they had a lot of fun doing some green screen videos with that one. Mm -hmm. And even some on the road videos when we went to our state capital field trip. So that was a lot of fun. Great. Have you ever used e-books and e-readers? 
I am a huge proponent of ebooks. I love reading on my Kindle. Um, for my students, um, the, our local educational service unit, sort of our technology people around us, um, have purchased an OverDrive subscription for all of the students so mm -hmm. they can access some OverDrive material. And then uh, FirstBook had an initiative this year called Open eBooks. Um, because we're a title school, we can participate in that. And there's thousands and thousands of ebooks available to the students um, that way, and we've been promoting it. And our local library just got on board with Hoopla, which is a great new app uh, for checking out and downloading uh, digital materials. But I've, I've been pushing ebooks for a very long time. I love them. Great. How could one get started with gamified homework? Oh, getting started with gamified homework. Um, I would uh, really look at your students and figure out what their deficit is, maybe something that's not taught in the core curriculum well. Um, in our case, it was the basic math uh, computation. And just focus on that. And I would list out at least the first 10 or 15 levels of skill level. Um, one of the things that I did was the basic uh, di uh, multiplication and division facts were my first two levels, and I assessed those every week, even if the kids had passed, just to keep them up. But I would I would pick uh, just a, an easy set of skills and something that you can easily make um, homework for. Great. Do you have an advisory team of teachers who help you plan and manage the March Madness book event, or do you do it all yourself? Um, this year, uh, I did have um, Barb Gilman from, from Omaha, Nebraska. Her, she's mm -hmm. at Barb in Nebraska on the Twitter. Um, she uh, collaborated with me a little bit, and uh, she recorded uh, audio summaries for all of the books, mm -hmm. where she would read the, the back cover and posted those along with uh, the voting forms online using um, Audio Boom, I think, to uh, help out with that. But otherwise, it's just me on my own right now. Mm -hmm. How much access do your students have to technology at your school? Oh, great question. Um, we are, uh, as a district, we accidentally stumbled upon one-to-one. -one. Um, so next year, we're rolling mm -hmm. out um, we're not quite one-to-one -one yet, but next year we're going to roll out second through 12th graders will be one-to-one -one with Chromebooks. And kindergartners mm -hmm. and first graders will have a card of iPads for each two classrooms to share. Plus we have a computer lab. And we're a Google Apps for Education School. And this leads into my next question that I have. This is a teacher teaches in a non-Google Apps for Education School. Would it be worth that teacher's time to uh, get Google certified? That is a great question. Um, I would say go for it. it was, I did not find it extremely difficult. Um, you can always go through and learn the things that you need to for the, for the testing. Um, if you're a Google user, I would go through the certification just because mm -hmm. I learned a lot that I hadn't known before about Google Docs and Google Gmail and everything just by going through the certification process too. So mm -hmm. I think for those people that like to learn and uh, really use things to the best of their ability, they should go through the part. Terrific. Is it hard to pass the Google certification test? Uh, the hardest part was finding two hours where I could sit down and take the test. Ah. But it was it was just, it wasn't a difficult test, but um, mm -hmm. it did take you have to sit down and you have to be in front of your computer and Google snaps pictures of you to make sure you're not cheating and it's a pretty complicated process. <laughs> okay, those were the questions that I captured. I'm not sure if anybody else has questions for Nate. If so, you can type them here in the chat. Paula has her hand raised. Go ahead, Paula. Hi, Nate. Uh, it was so great to hear all the background story for your uh, March Book Madness um, and looking forward to participating even on a bigger scale next year. This was my first year participating in your project, um, and we were in the middle of some test prep stuff, so I didn't get to follow through quite as much as I wanted to, but we better prepared next year. Um, I would like to 
hear a little bit more about your um, badge gamification stuff and maybe I know I need to visit your website. You said there's stuff there that I can look up, but just kind of like you know, what I could do over the summer maybe to get started in that. Sure. All right. Um, so I think that one of the big questions, Paula, is to uh, decide if you want to do online badging or if you're going to do it in the uh, physical media. Uh, like I said, the, the students really prefer the physical media. I've, I've seen they they get enough screen time with other stuff and they like to really um, own it physically. Um, I would decide uh, uh, what badges that you're going to award. I, I awarded um, a range of badges from achievement level badges, and there's examples on the web page for um, scoring well on a test, for um, reading every night, um, perfect attendance for the month. Um, there was behavior badges for kind students. There was silly badges like uh, just coming to our classroom parties, um, those kind of things and just sort of lay out the criteria of what you want and then figure out how you're going to display them, if it's going to be table tents or if it's going to be up on the wall, um, that kind of thing. And then for each badge that you choose, uh, make sure that you have very clear expectations of what it takes to achieve them. So right now my office, I'm looking at um, our badges up on the wall and um, we've got a You've Got Mail badge, and that's specifically for being able to send and receive email without any assistance from the teacher. Or for our kindergartners, their Mighty Mouse badge, where they're able to not drive the mouse off the table crazy when they're on the computer, which takes them a little while to learn. So clear expectations, and then knowing that um, you've got uh, uh, room to grow, you can always add badges. And A couple of more questions came while you were answering that, Nate. Um, do you find the students really like the classroom leaderboard photo board? Um, yeah, I do. The, if I, I will put a, a caveat there that the, the leaderboard only works if you have a classroom culture that you've established where it's OK to not be on top of it. Mm -hmm. So you really have to build that in first. But once that's established, it's, it works really well. Good. Um, could you tell us more about the Twitter chats you participate in and actively follow? Sure. Um, I've been tweeting since, I don't know, 2007. It's been a while. <laughs> and um, my favorite Twitter chats are voice chat. Shout out to Paula. Um, that's my, my favorite one during the week. Um, it's just a great place to collaborate. Um, I participate in uh, any BED chat on Wednesday evenings, which is um, the Nebraska uh, Educators Chat. And oh, look, folks here. <laughs> and I participate in Midwest Librarian Chat on Tuesdays once in a while. Um, we have a dads and ed, so any, any guys out there uh, that need a, a, a place to chat. Um, every other Monday, we have dads and ed, which is actually a live uh, video show uh, podcast that has a chat with us um, on Monday evenings. And anytime I'm feeling fast and furious, I jump into Teach Like a Pirate chat on Monday, which is just head spinningly uh, difficult to follow, but it's a fun mm -hmm. chat to be in. That's great. Um, Paula, you had something else you'd like to ask? Yes, I thought I'd take this opportunity, Nate, to see if you have any time available next week for my students to do a Google Hangout with one of your classes. <coughs> they, <coughs> pardon me. They've been preparing uh, their Google um, poem galleries. And we'd love, they keep asking me, who are we going to share them with? Who are we going to share them with? So check your calendar and let me know. I will do that. I have some fourth grade students, Paula, that are just finishing up their poetry unit. So that might be awesome to do. So I will write that down. Very cool. Terrific, Nate. Those were all the questions that I was able to share. I know Barb just came in the room, but um, I'm going to give her an opportunity to share if she'd like to.
maybe we could give Barb um, the microphone and let her talk about how she participated in the March Madness. It was awesome. I just gave you the mic, Barb. The talk button is up towards the top. If it's the same layout as on the iPad as on a desktop, you've got to turn on the mic in here first, and then that should activate your iPad mic. Well, while Barb's getting going, I have a theory about at the education universe that any conference that you go to, you will find somebody who is also Twitter friends with Barb in Nebraska. So you guys can test that the next time you go to a conference or an education event. It looks like you turned it on and then immediately off, Barb. How did you get, Nate, this question goes to Nate as Barb is trying to get the mic on. How did you get local TV coverage for your March Book Madness? Oh, great question. Um, so uh, one of the things that I, I do as part of my self-promotion for our classroom is to make sure that my Twitter account, which I use to brand everything, um, is that I follow and interact with um, all local news reporters that are also on Twitter. So mm -hmm. um, NTV White News is um, uh, one of our closest friends in town and also a Twitter follower. And he had um, just kind of noticed what was going on on Twitter and uh, made the contact there. Oh, OK. Yes, it is, Peggy. It's challenging to usually get local, me local media to share positive good news about schools. Yeah, our local. Uh, uh, school district when they got the phone call from the media, they had just gotten three or four other negative phone calls, so they were not looking forward to the phone call when it happened. And they right, decided sure. To something positive. <laughs> That's great. Does anyone else want to ask Nate a question or comment about either the Global Read Aloud or something similar. I see Barb still has the mic, but it's off. Yes, if you go to the web page, uh, Barb's in the chat. She was sharing her awesome uh, book uh, bracket that her husband did on the wall. It's the one with the green uh, background. I'm going to pull it up here on the on the slides. It's the first one here right on my hand. Uh, her husband did a fantastic job making um, their uh, bracket at the school there in Omaha. Thanks so much for sharing and for being our feature teacher, Nate. Um, it seems like we're about ready to wrap up. Oh, there's another question. Uh, talk about, I thought we were going to wrap up. 
Can you talk <laughs> about some of the video projects your students have done? Sure. Um, this is from Peggy. And uh, so for some of the video projects that we've done, we did the iReading group. Um, also on the website you'll find uh, we did some Midwest uh, regions video projects that were kind of fun. Those both used green screens. Um, this year, uh, during the Global Read Aloud, uh, some of our students did um, uh, Team Duck, Team Rabbit videos where they uh, cheered on which team they wanted uh, for the Duck Rabbit book, uh, trying to convince people um, what they were, uh, what the character was in the book, duck or a rabbit. Um, and one of the things as a professional that I do a lot of is the screencasting videos, um, both to teach my students what they need and give directions, and also for uh, to help uh, professionally develop my staff. Um, Peggy, with the green screen question, I'm just looking real quick. Um, we used at the time we had uh, Mac computers, and so we'd use the Photo Booth app um, with green screen. But uh, we do use the iPad app also. Our second grade teachers love the green screen on the iPad. Oh, and one of our most successful video projects was the, um, the airplanes across uh, the United States that we did um, during the 2014 uh, March Book Madness, I think, yeah, which we uh, took an idea from the Jimmy Fallon video. And so I learned a lot from Jimmy Fallon with education. And um, instead of throwing sub sandwiches across um, the country, um, our students uh, read the book I'm Here and threw paper airplanes from one uh, side of the screen to the other side, and then we collected uh, videos from across uh, 14 states and several Canadian provinces, and were able to stitch together a video of a paper airplane that traveled from class to class across uh, the country. So, yeah, we're, <laughs> Peggy, we've actually started uh, started talking about doing a Fallon Ed chat <laughs> on Thursday evenings. Um, we even have the hashtag, I think. Yeah. That's great. Does anyone have any other questions or comments for me? I see some typing. Yes, Nate, thanks so much for sharing today. Let's see if I can find. Our upcoming show slide. And I will turn the mic over to Peggy. Or I did find it and it that didn't work. Well, I'm just going to jump right on the mic. There seems to be a little lag there. Um, but uh, I want to say a huge thank you to Nate for squeezing us in to his very busy life here at the end of the school year. We love the featured teacher um, shows uh, on Classroom 2.0 Live because it's so great to hear from teachers in the classroom, in the schools, sharing examples about the things that they're passionate about and the ways they do them. We get so many great ideas about that. So thank you so much, Nate. And I do want to remind everyone that we don't have a show next Saturday because that is the uh, 4T virtual conference. And there's a link to that in our live binder today. Totally free 
three days worth of awesome presentations. They're always great. Their presenters are all trained. They know how the tools work. They do them all in Blackboard Collaborate. So you're a pro at that if you've been coming to our sessions. So I hope that you'll sign up and then you'll get links to all the recordings even if you can't attend them live. So I want to encourage you to do that. <clears throat> and then the following weekend is our Memorial Day holiday weekend in the United States. So we'll be off for two weeks, but then we'll be back June 4th, and we'll have three more shows before our summer break. So I hope you'll all plan to come back and join us on June 4th. And now, <clears throat> Lori, why don't you go ahead and wrap up these last few slides. Okay, Peggy, the Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place, including the Host Your Own Webinar series. So you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate room just like this one. As long as your event is public, your event is free. You can nominate a featured teacher by filling out the form here. It's also in the live binder, just like Nate was a featured teacher today. You can nominate yourself as well. You can complete the survey from either the, the link that will be in the chat box or you can take the tab in the live binder in the resources area. Once you complete the survey at the bottom, you can request a professional development certificate that will print out with your name when you get it back, as well as uh, make sure you include your personal email address to receive this. Schools tend to block it. Special thanks to Nate Balcom, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in this show today. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs>